Um, so our next speaker is uh, Carl Landile, and he'll be uh, talking about the use of uh, gene editing technologies in rodents. Welcome, Dr. Landile. No. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, I'd like to begin, again, as, by thanking the organizers for inviting me to come in and, and speak to you today. Uh, my talk is about the use of gene editing uh, technologies in rodents. Um, <clears throat> now, rodents, why rodents? Rodents are mammals, right? We're doing, why are we making these models in the first place? The reason we're making the models in the first place is we're doing this for typically for, for basic biological, everything from asking basic biological questions about how uh, genetics affects uh, a mammalian system, uh, all the way to making models of particular human diseases. Okay? So <clears throat> the mouse is a model. Uh, as a mammalian model, it, it's, a ma it's a mammal, right? So it's, it's more like us than zebrafish, though zebrafish, uh, but they're bigger, right? And the zebrafish, uh, are way easier to maintain, but for a, for a mammal, they're small and they're easy to maintain and they're fecund. Right? They make you can make lots of mice really fast, uh, on for, you know from the perspective of other mammalian systems. Okay, but more importantly, the genetics are extremely well understood in these animals. <clears throat> so there, we know uh, for sure since we've done all the uh, the genome sequencing that the similarity to humans is well over ninety percent. Importantly, there's an availability of inbred strains, right? So Peter showed this really nice, uh, unintelligible pedigree of all the available uh, inbred mouse strains. So let me dwell on this for a little bit and remind you that each of those inbred strains are strains of mice that are genetically identical, right? Every single animal is as, as close as can possibly be essentially twins, right? And so that allows you to look at a particular perturbation or treatment or experiment in those animals that removes the genetic variability that you would find among the individuals in this room, for example. Okay? So, um, and, and the interesting thing uh, with all those inbred strains is that each one has been selected for a particular phenotype, where that phenotype, remember phenotype, is the overt expression of the particular collection of variations of genes that are all put together in that one animal, right? That one individual. And so you have all these uh, individuals that are genetically identical and, in w and they all have specific characteristics for which they've been selected, right? <clears throat> and, and that's an extremely powerful tool. And then finally, they, they're highly, they're the, maybe the first mammal that was highly amenable to, uh, to um, genome modification, right? And by this point, 30 years out from the first, the, the dawn of the age of transgenesis, as Peter put it, there's thousands of genetically modified str uh, strains of mice in existence. Um, and to the extent Peter introduced you to the idea of doing modifications through embryonic stem cells, there are, in fact, banks of embryonic stem cells with mutations in almost all the mouse genes have been developed. So you can just go to, theoretically, go to this bank of, of embryonic stem cells and obtain the mutation in which you're interested. Okay. So look a little bit farther into the, um, in, in the milestones in mouse genetics, right? So in, in the early 1900s, Mendel's laws were verified in mammals using mouse coat colors. Right? In the 20s, the genetic basis of cancer was, was recognized. Right? In the 30s, uh, we recognized the genetic, <coughs> the transmission of tumors right, with mouse mammary tumor virus. In the 40s, we began to understand histocompatibility antigens, the things that understand that recognition of self versus non-self and allowed then eventually the um, and a greater understanding of our ability of, of what it meant to make uh, inbred strains and how that affected uh, tissue transplantation. 
In the 50s, the biological effects of radiation and chemical mutagenesis were understood and began to, began to be applied to, uh, to mice. Okay? But in 1980 is when, is the dawn, in, in blue here, is the dawn of the age of transgenesis, when people figure, first introduced the technology of taking an exogenous piece of DNA and plopping that into the mouse genome. And immediately, it, it became uh, a very powerful technique for understanding the role of a gene when you overexpressed it, okay? Uh, or expressed it in a time, in an inappropriate time and place. Okay. Um, uh, in, um, by also by in the early 80s, we recognized more about the similarity uh, between mammalian species because we understood that chromosomes are, it's not just that you seem to share the same kinds of genes, but you share blocks of chromosomes. So the genome, the entire genome is organized uh, in generally the same way. So you have blocks that have been shuffled around by evolution, but you know, if genes in a neighborhood tend to travel together, whether you're a human or a mouse. Okay. Um, the uh, embryonic stem cell, the, the age of gene targeting, quickly followed on in the late 80s. Um, in 1990, we, as, as Peter talked about, we went back into doing um, ENU mutagenesis. Uh, and then, you know, we knew by 2000 as the, as the genome project in the early 2000s, you know, how many genes there were. We knew the entire sequence of the genome. And then in 2007, right, because of uh, it, it, knocking out individual genes on a one by one at a time boutique basis was relatively inefficient, the knockout mouse project, uh, well, the thing that is now known as the knockout project, uh, came online where there was a, where there were transnational attempts to do high throughput mutagenesis in these embryonic stem cells. So to develop these banks of, of embryonic stem cells that had been characterized in terms of what mutations exist and to which one can go and draw uh, a mutation, uh, a, a mutant embryonic stem cell from which you could develop and produce your, your particular knockout animal. Um, and then in 2009, and, and basically this, finally the subject of, of, of this whole conference, is the targeted nucleases came online um, scientifically and commercially. Okay. Now, we're talking about, my, my talk is about rodents, so I'll remind you that there's also the, the rat. And the rat is also a nice mammalian model. Um, and has been used uh, for a, probably an equal amount of time. It's larger, it's more, slightly more expensive to maintain, and has a slightly longer generation time, but not a lot. Um, the advantage of being larger is you can get more material per animal. So for biochemical studies, it's, it's, it's potentially really useful. And it's really been pref a preferred model for both toxicological and behavioral studies, uh, neurobiological studies. Uh, rats have evolved, co-evolved along with us, eating the same stuff we do, and so their their uh, toxicological system is is similar to ours. Has to deal with the same sort of stuff, right? They, you know, we we eat Big Macs, they eat Big Macs, right? So, <clears throat> um, and also behaviorally, they have a much they're they're smarter, uh, at least from our point of view. They have a much more uh, rich behavioral repertoire that is easy to, to maintain. They're much more trainable. And so for <clears throat> neurological beha and behavioral studies, they, they're, uh, they're, they've been really popular. Okay? However, <clears throat> genome modification was really not available for this, this strain. As, 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 as Peter alluded to, mice, mice were it for mammals for the longest time. Um, you could do transgenesis. Initially, it was fairly inefficient, mostly for technical reasons. There are also no embryonic stem cells really available till 2009. Okay, so you couldn't do targeted mutagenesis at all. All right. So we'll go back and just we'll just remind ourselves. We'll go back and look at, at Peter's description of the process of doing targeted mutations in the bad old days, right, pre-2009, um, where you would start out. You would have to obtain or produce your embryonic stem cells. And I'll note here, not only 
were these only available for mice, but they were only available for certain substrains of mice, just two, basically. And, and, and yet, so that, that, whole, that whole zoo of mouse strains was unavailable to, for genome modification. Uh, and the only way that you can move a genome onto one of those backgrounds was take one of these mutated mice and back cross it for 10 generations uh, with the strain in which you're interested. And that's, you know, that's close, but it's even not exactly pure, okay? But um, assuming you have the ES cells, you manipulate those cells in vitro and isolate your targeted clones, and that's maybe four to eight weeks of time. And then you'd insert those targeted clones, as you know, Peter showed the really nice uh, pictures, you'd inject those into blastocysts, and uh, you'd transfer those into foster mothers, you'd screen for chimeric offspring, which have the nice coat color differences, and uh, find the ones that are carrying the mutations, and then you'd breed those. And one of the things that, 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 that is always alighted in talking about this is that not all targeted clones actually go germline. Not actually, they don't all actually wind up passing on the, the mutation. So you, if, from the point of view of a practitioner of the art, you would take these guys and you would mate them and you would go, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, and maybe the gene would come through. And, and there, a certain percentage of the times it wouldn't, right? And then <clears throat> you'd um, mate these to produce uh, founders, so that's gonna take another eight weeks, and then you just have one of the two alleles knocked out, so you have to mate those again. You take another two months, another generation time for your, for your mouse, and it's eight weeks. So you have your first homozygous mutants, the ones that will express the phenotype that you want. They're gonna be a minimum of, of eight months, right? A long time. Um, <clears throat> all right, so, to, I mean, Peter talked about this already, but the targeted nuclease family, the came online in, uh, in 2009. The first, the first zinc fingers came on board. Uh, and those were actually published in rats before they were published in mice, right? which is sort of interesting. Shows you the utility of these targeted nucleases uh, to go after any species you want. Now, the disadvantages, as Peter told you, they were, they were horrifyingly expensive, especially for an academic laboratory. They were not so easy to construct. There was limited target availability. And from a commercial point of view, there was really, even from an academic point of view, there was a really onerous IP reach through, right? Um, so whoops, then, then the ta uh, talons came on board and the rodent applications came uh, almost immediately, 2011. And they were easier, easier to make than zinc finger nucleases and they can theoretically target any sequence. Right? Um, then CRISPR-Cas9. So the rodent applications became, uh, came online in 2013, were first published in 2013. They're extremely easy to engineer. Um, they're amenable to multiplex targeting. They're potentially more prone to off-target immunogenesis and somewhat more target restricted, in, at least in theory, than, than talons. But nonetheless, they're, <clears throat> they're extremely, uh, you know, they came on board and, and everybody jumped onto the system, and I'll explain a little bit why in, in a second. So just to remind you, you have where what we're doing is we're harnessing the cells endogenous DNA repair system. So double strand of breaks, nobody likes double strand of breaks in their DNA. The cell repairs them by either non-homologous end joining, by just uh, sticking the blunt ends together, and typically either adding or subtracting DNA when that sequence when that happens. Um, and then you can get homologous, homology-directed repair, and you, un, you take basically the other strand of DNA that we all have as, as um, you know, as mutants, I mean, as, as humans, I'm sorry, as, as, uh, as, as uh, <coughs> eukaryotes, and uh, you use that, to, you just copy that and repair, and that's error-free. And so we can co-op that system, we can take a targeted, uh, some se targeted sequence, with some editor, and that editor then you can introduce uh, nonsense, I mean, missense here, or you can just change the sequence with the indel, or you can provide an exogenous targeting vector and, and uses, use that as your repair template and plug in things from as large as fairly large pieces of DNA or as small as a single base pair and do a single base pair change in the DNA. 
All right. So now let's contrast what this means in terms of how we go out and produce those animals. Now remember, we were talking about eight months, maybe, to get a homozygous animals. So here we treat the one cell embryos with, the, with our reagent, our, our double-stranded nuclease, uh, talons or CRISPRs. And we transfer those treated animal, animals to foster mothers. We screen for mutant offspring. 68 weeks later, you have what you want. Okay? And so, I, so Peter laughed and said, you know, he, he commented on me uh, <coughs> with, with my, I have to show my, my movie too, again from the ISTT website. So what we have here are a series of, of one cell mouse embryos. But if I showed you these embryos, you wouldn't know. Uh, they're indistinguishable for any other kind of mammalian embryo. And so each one is surrounded by essentially what's called the, what's the mammalian eggshell. It's, a, it's called the zona pellucida. And you see in each one, or in, you will see in each one if you look, and you can see close here, um, that there are two pronuclei, right? One, one is the female complement. These are the genes that are coming from mom. These are the genes that are coming from dad. And, and in this case, what we're doing is we're injecting into one of those. And you'll see as the needle comes in, uh, comes through, you put it into one of those pronuclei, typically the male pronucleus. Um, you push the DNA in, you can see the thing expand, and you take that out, and it's a video game. You sit there with a pair of, of uh, micromanipulators, and you go, you set this one aside, and you go through the whole rest of the plate of those, and then those go into moms and, and become pups somewhere down the road. Now, one of the things about this system is, I mean, we're, this, these, this was, was initially developed for using for putting DNA into the genome. Now we're just introducing the reagents so that are going to modify the genome. And in fact, we don't even have to go into the pronucleus. We can just throw the DNA into the cytoplasm, I mean, the reagents into the cytoplasm by injecting or even by uh, something called electroporation, so other physical methods of getting DNA into those. So the de debut of the CRISPR-Cas9 system in mice was this, this paper in, uh, in Cell from Janish's lab. And it made everyone sit up and take notice. It's the results were that they did, that there was just outstanding, mind-boggling efficiency in the system here, where if you, as high as 100, depending on what lo locus they were targeting, 100% of the animals were carrying a mutation of at least one allele. 95% of them had homozygous targeting. Both alleles, the maternal and paternal alleles, were mutated in the same animal, okay, given certain conditions. And better yet, you could multiplex this, right? The nice thing about the CRISPR-Cas9 um, system as opposed to the talons or the zinc fingers, the other nucleases, you have to engineer one uh, set for every target. In this case, we have the, the, the protein part of it is the same always. All you need to do is change the guide RNAs. And so you can throw in lots of guide RNAs with the same amount of, of Cas9 protein, and in this case, 80% of the pups from double gene targeting were, were double homozygotes. Right? So, <clears throat> so everyone, uh, everyone meaning the industry, there's several hundred uh, facilities around the world which are engaged in this kind of work, uh, that our, our service facilities, either commercially or academically, but became immediately obvious, gene targeting rodents is really, really easy. And is ESL, I mean, it actually implies ESL-mediated targeted mutagenesis is in some ways obsolete. What does that mean? It's actually faster to design a, CAS, a CRISPR Cas for your target and target that than it is to go back to the comp library and get your mutation from the comp library, get the cells from the comp library and make your mice using those. And cheaper, it's faster and cheaper. So in, in, that, in that sense, it's obsolete, except for particular purposes, because if we want to do large scale mutations, sometimes it's, there, there are efficiencies that do not yet exist in zygote, uh, in, in, in modifying the embryo directly. And so they're not obsolete, but their use is certainly going to go way down. But the other point is the simultaneous, the simultaneous targeting in multiple genes. And, and I'm going to spend a little time about this and remind everybody uh, about you know, genetics and, and, uh, 
and what they learned in beginning genetics. But you remember, you'll have two mutant animals. So you'll have generated these two mutant animals with, with a particular mutation in gene one and mutation in gene two, and you cross those. And 25% of those animals will be carrying um, those, uh, you know, will be carrying the gene that you want. It's an eight week process, right? Well, now you have to cross um, <clears throat> these with each other, right, to get them combined. And only six and a half percent of those animals, and it's another eight weeks to get to this. And now you can start breeding your animals to get what you want, right? So this double mutation, you know, that assumes that, th that these are actually even fertile, right? If we think about going to uh, making, you know, your, your triple mutant, we, we sort of, we, we can, we, it's, it's an iterative process, right? So we have mutant one and mutant two, and we cr cross that with a mutant three, and now you get this animal, 12.5% of the animals are what you want, and then you mate those, and only 1% of the animals after that cross are available. So you've gone through generation, multiple generations and lots of time and tons of animals that you don't even care about to generate this multiple mutation. With, with CRISPR-Cas9, the efficiencies are so astoundingly high that it allows you to do this in one fell swoop. <clears throat> so, you know, the, the kinds of mutations, I'm not going to give any specific examples, um, but the targeted mutagenesis has already been used to generate knockout mutations in activating uh, specific genes, right? knock-in mutations, inserting gen genetic material at a defined site, either, um, you know, single base changes or, um, uh, or larger pieces of DNA, small pieces of DNA that you want for particular reasons, um, in inserting transgenes, throwing in a gene that is expressed in a way that is more physiological than the, we use endogenous promoters, the endogenous controls, uh, control systems for, gene in, uh, for genetic expression in the cell rather than the, the blunt force effect of doing transgenesis where we throw in sort of random insertions of stuff. And even to make large scale deletions or insertions, knocking out large regions of the genome and, and you know, examples of, 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 of <clears throat> I mean, there, there are, are human examples of those, right? So. Um, there are still some remaining issues for this. Of course, there's the issue of off-target mutagenesis, which everyone comes back to. Now, <clears throat> um, you know, system modifications are increasing, as, as Peter told you about, in, uh, are increasing the fidelity all the time. Um, in the animal model world, we sort of tend to not worry maybe so much about this because we always think, well, we can always breed these out, right? It, it, these are gonna go away as we continue to breed these animals, these un, uh, unlinked mutations, though, in, in reality, if we do this by chance, it takes a lot of breeding. We'd have to actually go look for them. And then the other is converting art to routine methodology. I mean, we are so early in the stage of doing this. Now, there are discussion lists online of those hundreds of facilities around the world. What are your conditions to make this work right? Um, and the answer is we're not sure yet, right? So what do we, how do we do this so that it, it becomes as routine as transgenesis became? or as gene targeting became. Um, so one of the questions is, what defines a good target? Not all alleles appear to be equally targetable, right? I, you know, from, from my experience, I know that we've tried knocking out a particular gene with multiple talons, multiple, uh, multiple CRISPRs, can't get the animal. And there are reasons there are multiple reasons why that might be. It just might be the availability of the genome, uh, the DNA at that stage of the genome, or it might be that the, the, this mutation is a previously unsuspected haploinsufficiency causes, um, causes is lethal, right? Um, <clears throat> so the question of whether we just want to knock out a gene or put something in, right? How do we bias the system so we one way to non-homologous uh, end joining, or the other way towards um, towards homologous homology directed rep, uh, um, repair. And uh, <clears throat> so again, a technical question that's being worked out. Um, and then finally, what are the best reagents, conditions, practices to do success uh, to guarantee success? All right. So <clears throat> it's this. This is. In summary, then, the, the targeted nucleases have really revolutionized mouse, rat, everything genome engineering, right? Um, 
So we're no longer limited by ESL availability. Now remember, you know, people will have good reasons to do mutations in particular background strains. Now we can do it. We don't care. We don't need to worry about making embryonic stem cells um, from, from the strain that you want, let alone the species that you want. Right? Um, so you can do any rodent species. You can do any species, rodent or otherwise. Um, the timelines to model generation have been significantly, significantly shortened. And then animal use for model production decreases simply on, this, on the breeding end in our ability to make animals quicker, faster, cheaper. We were also reducing the amount of money it takes, money that could be otherwise spent more productively for basic research. Okay. So with that, I'll take some questions. Nice talk, Carl. Thank you. Uh, so on the topic of breeding, yes. Um, do you really think the numbers will be uh, on the topic of breeding, do you really think the numbers will be reduced given that when you generate a mutant with a CRISPR, you would have to breed those mutations into subsequent generations? So as, as an effect, we're seeing that we may be doing more breeding than less. Right. So, um, so actually, let me remind all the people asking questions. You've been asked to identify yourself just for <laughs> the wider world out there. <laughs> uh, so I'm Banu Telugu. I'm a, a researcher at the University of Maryland. Uh, and I have an appointment with USDA. Okay, so now to your question was, right, are we going to really use less animals when we can, um, because now this is, has tremendous utility and, and we're all going to dive into making more mutations, more mutant animals sooner and faster, more easily. So really, right, in the use of animals, the number of animals we're using are going to be much less on the production end, right? And answering then, you know, just, just making those animals. Now, the utility for a particular strain, once it's made, you'll make as many animals as you need for whatever characterization you want. Some of those are going to be models for human diseases, and those will become standard animals for, uh, that will just be used commercially for, for testing, for example, animals where we've humanized the, um, humanize the immune system, right? Or, in fact, we've knocked out the immune system so we can use those as, as recipients for culturing tumors, for example. Right? In those cases, sure, those numbers will go up, right, in terms of the overall use of animals. And I think that was Peter's point, too. The overall use of animals mm -hmm. is probably going to go up. Um, but your model, you know, people will still use rodent models, but there was another question someone asked. Um, Monty here about using, you know, zebrafish versus versus um, versus rodents or any other animal. Right? So when you're thinking about choosing a model, now you drive it by your particular scientific need and question of how you're going to answer that. Right? Overall, yeah, I would say that we're going to have a lot, many, many more overall animals that are used in research for exactly that reason. But, but so what we're really doing is knocking down the number of animals needed to do the production. So maybe my question was not very clear in the beginning. Uh, what we have seen is that when, when we generate these mouse mutants with CRISPRs, uh, we tend to make, for example, uh, a mosaic animal. Yes. So in effect, what we had to do is breed subsequently to get the right mutations. So, so is that what you're really finding, or is it just uh, something? No, I mean, I think that's right. So everyone's been alighting the fact that what you get is, is mosaicism, right? So right. these animals that you produce where, where all the, you know, both alleles are targeted, right? The question is, did that happen early in development at the, at the one cell stage, stage, or did it happen at the 20 or the 100 or the 500 cell stage? And, and in point of fact, most of these animals are, that come out of this process are actually going to be mosaic in some sense, right? Which means that they'll have patches of cells that have mutations and patches of cells that don't have mutations or a patch of cells with uh, a targeted mutation. mutation at that allele and, and another patch that has a different mutation at that allele right? because it's somewhat of a random process, especially if it's non-homologous end joining. 
<clears throat> so yeah, what about those guys? Right? And then remember the in-frame deletions. Of Pardon one, me? The in-frame mutations that you see. Right, and some and right, and some of those are not going to knock out your gene. That's the other thing we've not talked about. But but only two out of three of your indels are actually going to result in if it's if it's a small indel is going to result in in gene ablation. Right. So one of the things we haven't mentioned, none of us have mentioned so far, is that when we generate these animals, we actually have to characterize every single allele that comes out. Okay. So that being said, what we care about is germline transmission. So yes, you need to breed those guys together right, at the end of the day to generate your animals. But you still starting, you can still be starting from uh, what appears to be a pair of double knockout animals, breed those together, and then you look through those for the ones that are carrying double knockouts, and you've, by definition, you've removed the mosaicism because you've gone through germline. Right? So you do have one other thing of breeding. But think about that com uh, as, as contrasted with We've mutated the line here. We've mutated these. Now we've got to mate them together. Now we've got to mate them together again. Um, it's, it's a lot more animals that way. So, yeah, so, yeah the mosaicism falls out of the picture uh, once you go one line thing of breeding. So. Um, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to uh, address the other questions at the, um, the general um, question ses session. But thank you very much, Dr. Landau. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat>